Okay, it's a great pleasure to have um, Ruth Gregory present this week's uh, seminar. She is visiting us virtually from <laughs> Durham University, and she's going to tell us about uh, holographic thermodynamics of accelerating black holes. Thank you for joining us. And we look uh, thank you, Denjo, and, and thank you for um, you know inviting me to talk about some of my work. Um, so I, I'm going to be talking today about some work that I've been doing over the past four to five years um, on thermodynamics of black holes, but a particular sort of black hole, which is uh, the accelerating black hole um, or the C metric. Uh, now, let me see, how do I get up? Oh, there we go. So um, a sort of an outline, just to give you an idea of, of the sort of flow of the talk. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time at the beginning talking about the geometry of accelerating black holes, because if you have, I mean, um, you know, people have varying degrees of experience with, with gravity and geometry, but even, even seasoned relativists um, may not have played an awful lot with this particular metric. And I think it's, it's worth just kind of you know, digging into it a little bit and uh, revealing some of its um, features. Then I want to talk about the, uh, the new uh, work that we've, we've been doing in, in this sequence of papers, and that is the thermodynamics of tension. And I'll explain what I mean by that, but essentially we're adding, if you like, cosmic strings to black holes. Uh, then I'll talk about how we really kind of nailed the, um, the accelerating black hole, essentially via um, holography. So we used uh, a sort of ADS-CFT types of arguments to, to really um, solve the problem. And then I'll talk about some other uh, things that uh, we sort of, uh, if you like, icing on the cake or little frills and bells and whistles, which was um, actually something that, that was motivated by, by you, Brian, um, sort of the papers that you, you wrote on Penrose process and thinking about, um, you know, some of the expressions that you had where you uh, write the thermodynamics in a more chemical form and you step away from the, uh, the sort of geometry and parameters and the general relativity. Um, okay, so uh, what, what's the C metric? So to, how do we accelerate a black hole? So it's kind of a, I like to sort of think of the black hole as the ultimate slippery object because the event horizon is a bit of a strange place. It's something that we kind of think we know what it is, but it's defined globally. So if we are accelerating a black hole, we have to pull or push it. And how do we do that? Because, you know, the event horizon is this boundary, causal boundary between uh, things that we can see and things that we can't. And so to be on the event horizon, you have to be traveling at the speed of light. So what this kind of turns into is a condition on the energy momentum of something touching the horizon, which is that its energy has to equal sort of the tension, the pull, the um, pre negative pressure, um, at least, you know, simultaneously, sort of actually as it touches the horizon. So fortunately, we have a candidate for that, which is the cosmic string. So cosmic strings were kind of in fashion about, oh gosh, 30, 40 years ago now as uh, alternatives to inflation. Uh, but they are essentially vacuum defects and uh, they can arise if you have a symmetry breaking process where you have a non-trivial uh, U1, a non-trivial circle in your vacuum manifold. And so the idea is that you're, you, you're, uh, you pick a vacuum that as you go around a circle in space, your vacuum winds around this circle in the vacuum manifold. And so inside the circle somewhere, there's energy source. And it turns out that the energy momentum is to a very good approximation, just an energy per unit length and a tension per unit length. So the, to a really good approximation, the uh, cosmic strain looks like sort of a delta function, something very localized with just two primary components. So when you look at what the metric of one of these things is, it gives you a conical deficit. So all that means is that in the space transverse to the, to the string, this plane, 
you cut out a little wedge with um, angle this delta, which is related to the uh, energy per unit length of the string via that formula in the corner, 8 pi g mu, and then you re-identify. So globally, look, if you look sort of around, loc you know, sorry, if you look locally, sorry, around, your space is still flat, but globally, you have some non-trivial effect. So you still can get lensing or something, some interesting phenomena going on. But there's no tidal forces. There's no sort of long range space-time curvature. So now let's turn to the accelerating black hole metric. So this is something that's called the C metric. And I think that, it, I think it was probably from a rather early classification where there were type A, type B, and this was type C. Um, but I'm going to write it, I'm, I'm giving a particular set of coordinates here, which um, were, uh, I guess, really investigated by Hong and Tio. Um, and I'm choosing these coordinates to give a, so that I can, you know, really highlight the physical features of the space-time. So we have a geometry where we've got, it sort of looks a bit like a black hole because we've got our familiar angular coordinates, theta and phi. What is a bit different is that we have this g of theta in there. So this is um, a function that uh, is not quite one. So it distorts the sphere if this capital A is non-zero or ma more precisely. Um, you'll also notice I've put a k in there that we'll, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about in a bit. <clears throat> and then the t and r parts of the geometry look again a bit like Schwarzschild, um, but the potential, which would have been 1 minus 2m on r, is now something more complicated. And the eagle eyes, eyed will notice I have put this in anti de Sitter space because I have an, one, an r squared on l squared in that potential. There's also an overall conformal factor. So now let's deconstruct this and talk about what each of these pieces are. So I'll start by looking at um, the function f of r gtt. So this is um, this is what if you like, defines the black hole. You have a parameter m and a cosmological constant l. So here we see that we this f is what determines horizon structure. So if we sort of thought L was big and capital A was small, we'd have a horizon somewhere near 2M. So that would be our black hole horizon. Uh, the, the presence of this capital A means that there could be a second horizon if A is big enough, because then might, you've got essentially, if you look at large R, uh, if A squared L squared is bigger than one, it looks like you get another zero of F. So, and this is really what's telling you about the causal structure. Now, this K is what we put in to uh, talk about conical deficits, the cosmic strings. So if I ignore A um, and just look at the negative cosmological constant, so we're in anti de Sitter again, our cosmological constant's minus three on L squared, I have something that looks like Schwarzschild ADS but it has this K in there. Now K determines if you have a conical singularity on the axis, you know, the north and south poles of the black hole. So this is roughly what it would look like. If you look near, say, the north pole um, and expand for small theta, if there's a K, you don't quite get um, a, a sort of the, the radius, the circumference of little circles is not 2 pi r or 2 pi delta theta, it's 2 pi on k. And so this is what tells you you have a deficit and this deficit delta, the angle that you kind of cut out of the plane, is 2 pi into 1 minus 1 on k. So we identify this with a tension um, by setting that equal to 8 pi mu. So this is, uh, you know, this is, of course, an exact uh, conical singularity, but um, you can replace it with one of these cosmic strings. 
So now let's talk about the parameter A. So this is what um, tells you that the black hole is accelerating. So here you see A turns up in F, in G, and also in that omega, the conformal factor. So the acceleration, even if you don't get a second horizon, i.e. another zero of F, acceleration shows up as a sort of shift of infinity. So you get distortion of the spheres, you've got conical deficits, but now you have an infinity when omega goes to zero. So if, um, cause if theta is bigger than pi on two, for example, you, your conformal factor blows up when r is minus one on a cos theta. So you get um, the boundary of ADS now comes in to finite r coordinate. So <clears throat> again, trying to deconstruct that a further, if we just ignore the black hole, let's set m to zero. Um, a looks like it modifies the ADS length scale, but really this is just a sort of um, a little, almost a trick, if you like. Um, what, what you see is that what you have is the Rindler metric. So again, this is talking about how the boundary shifts. So you get potentially an acceleration horizon, or if A is small, you get something which we say is slowly accelerating. If AL is less than one, you don't get a second horizon. And it turns out you can do a coordinate transformation to return yourself to global ADS. But notice that when you do that, the time coordinate of the, if I step back, the time coordinate that was in your natural black hole metric is not quite the global time coordinate. It's got this scaling factor alpha, the square root of one minus a squared l squared. So this, um, what this is saying is that in uh, ADS, you can be accelerating um, if you are, but, but without um, reaching the boundary, you can be accelerating and yet still static. And what it means is that you go, um, you displace yourself from the center of ADS. So if we look at um, little r equals zero, so little r equals zero is the origin of these uh, Rindler coordinates, then uh, big R is actually not zero. You can sort of see that if I set um, r equal to zero, my omega is one, and my one plus capital R squared on L squared is one over one minus A squared L squared. So I've displaced myself from the center. So if I plot my coordinate, r equals zero, my little r is zero is now displaced from the center of ADS. So we have an off-center perspective. And here you can see that um, <clears throat> the thick dashed line is the coordinate infinity of R, which is not the boundary of ADS. And in the lower hemisphere, the boundary of ADS happens at finite R. So here we see what where the origin is displaced to A squared L to the fourth over one minus a squared L squared. So this is exactly the same as us being on the surface of the earth. We are not falling, we're static, but we're, we're in a non-inertial frame. So we're accelerating. Okay, so if we put this all together, we see that um, we have uh, a black hole because we have an event horizon. We also have an acceleration determined by this A parameter. And this kind of seems to counterbalance some of the effect of the cosmological constant. The other crucial thing is that we have an imbalance between the deficits on the north and south axis. So if we expand near theta is zero, we get one, um, one factor. And if we expand, which, is, which goes like one plus two MA, and if we expand around theta equals pi, we get a different um, sort of natural deficit angle. So what people usually do is that, uh, so here we've got, sorry, the, these are the two tensions. What people usually do is make one axis regular. So in this case, it would be the north axis, and we would have a deficit on the south axis. 
if you tried to make the south axis regular, you'd have a, a, an excess on the north axis. But a conical excess is a negative energy object. So we, tend, we prefer to avoid that. So um, if we make the north axis regular, then the south axis tension is Ma on K. And this is um, what the geometry sort of looks like a cartoon. So we have the cosmic string that provides a local conical deficit. So it's as if we've taken a sphere and we've kind of pinched it at the south pole. We pull on the sphere so we have something that's uh, a teardrop shape. And it's then the black hole is suspended from the boundary by a cosmic string. And the string tension provides a force to hold the black hole off center. And so we can again see that if we look at this uh, south pole tension or the differential tension, it looks like MA on K. Um, or, you know, in a sense, F is MA if our capital M was little m on K. So it looks a little bit like a Newton's law. So <clears throat> this is really sort of having <clears throat> gone through the C metric and kind of deconstructed it and talked about the meaning of the parameters. Uh, in general, of course, we have horizons. Um, so if we were talking about thermodynamics, we'd be talking about a local law for the black hole horizon. Um, but what, what most of the work that um, I've been doing is slowly accelerating black holes in ADS because what we wanted to do was to actually pin down the thermodynamics of this black hole with the cosmic string. And we didn't want to have the extra horizon and you know potential obviously out of equilibrium situation. So this way we have a single temperature and clear sort of the clear thermodynamics. So to sum up, we have the parameters in the metric, M, L, A, and K. And if we add charge and rotation, we would have little e and little a. And so thermodynamically, we would expect charges and potentials associated with each. Um, so I'm going to begin by setting the charge and the rotation and even the acceleration to zero. First of all, to understand the effect of a conical deficit, in other words, K. So since the horizon is defined by a zero of F, is that a question? Yeah, right, Ruth. I'm just wondering uh, if... Uh, if... Uh, if is this metric useful if uh, I imagine a black hole, small black hole, about to be swallowed by a large one in some distant time? It's being it should be accelerated towards the uh, so uh, if, larger if, center. If you've got a, a merger like that, um, the you know the the black holes are. are sort of falling into each other but they're not they're actually still inertial in the sense of they're still um moving you know according to a sort of local inertial uh you know geodesic law there's no so typically yeah. they're not going to i don't think it's not there wouldn't be an approximation where i'm thinking of some enormous black hole like some galactic center and a distant black hole being accelerated towards it well, but but that's not acceleration. That's inertial motion. If it's, yes, yeah, yes, so, this is true. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. this would be the this would be a situation if um, you know that's if we have cosmic strings, if we have some you know some uh, higher symmetry group where there's a non-trivial u one. So this would be the the sort of um, situation in which we could potentially get a black hole that would have a cosmic string um, running through it. Okay. So oh, it yeah. is a, at least the, the situation I'm talking about, we haven't um, sort of looked at, you know, more um, diffuse types of setups, like if you had some sort of, you know, magnetic uh, flux tube going through a black hole. This is really the, the very very thin conical defect. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I see that the, uh, the geometry in the symmetry would have been different than what I was talking about. I, I hadn't tuned into the, the uh, conical singularity being central, ask, yeah. the central of the black hole. Go ahead, John Brian. Quick question, just out of curiosity. Um, if you give the string attention, can you get Hooke's law? Can you make the black hole oscillate? If, um, so hang on, you're thinking of making the, oh, I see, okay. Um, this black hole hanging off the event horizon with a string. Sorry, not the event horizon, the, the, the ADS boundary with a string. Um, I'm just wondering if you gave the- Yeah, well, that's a good one. Attention. Can you get something So like of course we don't have a time dependent uh, metric, but I suppose, Brian, that would be, uh, covered by looking at the perturbation analysis of that metric, wouldn't it? That would be one, uh, but you could also imagine situations. Very where... interesting question there. It sounds horrendous, I have to say. <laughs> and, I, and believe me, I can, I'm can. i used to, <laughs> to perturbation algebra. But <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. But for a mass on a spring, you can have constant acceleration just giving you a constant extension, and it would be static. So there could be static solutions, I would imagine. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. You, it went very quiet there at the end. So, for a mass on a on a spring, I can imagine a constant acceleration giving a constant extension of the spring, and having a static configuration. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then you look at, at fluctuations around that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of it. You know, I mean, you've, that's a that's a great question because I would imagine if you looked at fluctuations of that metric, you would get ones that would correspond to like um you know your unusual ring down type modes mm -hmm. so the black hole itself um wobbling but i would imagine there must be a mode like the, like what you're saying where the black hole itself um oscillates um so i is it is it a stable one um Good question. So I, yeah, it's, I, I, I don't know, but one can imagine, at least I can see how one might address the question. So you'd have to, you'd have to sort of look at, uh, at fluctuations, the hmm. perturbations around the metric. So shall I go on? Please, excellent. Okay. Um, so, right. So I just want to just try and isolate the th what's going on thermodynamically with the deficit. So if you um, put, so this is the idea, I guess, of Bardeen, um, Carter and Hawking. So you're throwing something into your black hole and you're uh, letting it settle and the horizon is going to shift. So our horizon is defined by f equals zero. So we imagine that um, we've added something to m, maybe our vacuum energy has changed. And so our horizon shifts. So we go, it goes from r plus to r plus plus delta r plus. And our mass parameter shifts and l shifts. So overall, um, f of r plus plus delta r plus which has to be zero is given by um f primed delta r plus plus df dm delta m plus df dl delta l so that's just a simple statement about um how uh, f changes and it's a, a relation <clears throat> that an identity that the sum of these three terms has to vanish so if r plus changes that's going to change uh, the area which which is the encoded in the entropy if little m changes big m is going to change and um, so does lambda so <clears throat> if i look at um that looks like the same slide <laughs> What's happened there? Sorry. <laughs> so temperature has the usual definition, um, which you know typically the easiest way of doing it is uh, by Euclidianization. So um, the entropy, on the other hand, and now has a factor of this uh, is affected by this deficit angle because the entropy is the area of the horizon, 
and so it gets a factor of one over k in it. Therefore, if I look at delta s, delta s is not just delta r plus, it's also got a delta k. So that means this uh, f primed delta r plus term, I can replace f primed with 4 pi t, but my delta r plus now is a delta s plus a delta k term. So that's what I replace my um, f prime delta r plus with. Then I ask, what is delta k? Now the tension is related to k. So if I look, change k, I change the tension. So it's fairly clear that delta k on k squared is just 4 delta mu. And then finally, we identify uh, p, our pressure term, as minus lambda, which is 3 on 8 pi L squared. And we take the standard sort of volume, geometric volume of the black hole, which again has this um, factor of k in it. And we see that we get a first law with tension. So our mass or enthalpy, as, as it's um, known, of the black hole is the m parameter divided by k. So delta m is v delta p, t delta s, and then there's this term here, uh, time, uh, at length scale times delta mu. We also have this SMA relation. So this um, m on k, we would expect actually the mass or the, thermo, inter, the energy of the black hole to change if, if k changes, because we could imagine forming a black hole from collapse of say shells of dust. And in that case, if we cut a wedge out of space time, our shell has less mass. So it makes sense to reduce the mass um, if this k is non-trivial. So this term multiplying the tension is what we call the thermodynamic length. We denoted it lambda. And we sort of think about it for reasons which will become apparent when thinking about the accelerating black hole, rather than thinking about the tension as of the whole string running all the way through the black hole, we kind of split it in two. We say there's a northern string and a southern string, and each of them have the same thermodynamic length in this case, which is r plus minus m. So this also kind of reinforces this uh, enthalpy interpretation, because if you compare it to the V delta P term, we have an L here, so that's minus 2 lambda, but our delta mu, the, um, mu is a tension, and a tension is a negative pressure, so if we thought about it instead as a, you know, it, as a pressure, this would be plus an L delta little p or something. So um, our, it's very much uh, in keeping with the V delta P term in this first law. So we have the same, uh, the same sort of thing going on. Now I want to just show how it, it how it sort of can, you can think of it at least as making sense um, by thinking about capture of a string. So here I imagine uh, that we have a setup where we have a cosmic string that's moving towards a black hole the black hole captures the string, but then because the, the sort of bits of the string far from the black hole are still moving to the right, the string eventually um, leaves the black hole and it's, you know, we would imagine that it would have captured the length of string that um, kind of interacted with the black hole. So um, that's the sort of picture. So how does this kind of go together. Uh, if, I, if I just do this kind of quasi-statically, it's slightly cheeky because of course these solutions are all, you know, the one in the middle is static and the Schwarzschild is static, but nonetheless, let me suppose that the enthalpy doesn't change in the first process, in the string capture process. Um, you could say entropy didn't change, but let, let's just say the energy doesn't change the enthalpy. Uh, then, um, going from phase one to phase two, I have introduced a deficit through the black hole. So my delta mu is roughly the tension of the string. My delta mu is mu. But from phase step two to step three, the, the 
the um, deficit has moved, it's gone away, so my delta mu is minus mu. So in, in step, in the second phase, um, I, I've sort of said that the minimal thing that you could have is that delta R plus is zero. So the motivation behind this is that um, normally you have, if you think about how, how do you prove the area theorem for a black hole, you think about the convergence of geodesics. So you see that the geodesics can't actually, uh, it, the provided positive um, energy goes into the black hole, the geodesics can, can only ever diverge. And the, cos the string itself never changes the sort of local geodesic uh, properties of the black hole. So if the geodesics can't converge um, when there's no deficits around, that's still going to be the case even when there's a cosmic string because it doesn't affect, it's no, there's no tidal forces. So the minimal thing here is that R plus doesn't change. So if we then ask, sort of draw a little table, what's going on? The first mass is M naught, the middle mass is, parameter is M1, the final mass parameter is M2. The one on K is, there's no deficit through the black hole, so it's one. There is a deficit, so it's one minus four mu, then there's none. So that means I can look at what the entropy is. So in um, the first and last cases, it's just pi m squared. And in the middle case, it's pi m squared times one minus four mu. And then finally, the enthalpy is m naught, m one times one minus four mu and m two. So if the enthalpy doesn't change, that means the m one parameter must increase by a factor of four mu m naught. And then, um, if R plus doesn't change, R plus is basically just M. So M2 would be M1, which is M naught into one plus four mu. So the overall increase in the mass of the black hole is four M naught mu, which is exactly uh, the diameter of the black hole times the energy per unit length of the string. So this, I mean, this is the minimal sort of thing that you might imagine. So that kind of makes some sense. Um, but let me get back to the accelerating black hole. Uh, this is now, I'm, I've, I've sort of put in the full Monty here. We've got full Kerr Newman um, uh, anti de Sitter black hole, but slowly accelerating. So we have little a for rotation, little e for charge, a li a li an L for the cosmological constant, and capital A for acceleration. So this is just to show the full solution, and it's very, very similar to uh, what we were looking at before. It's just now got some cross terms coming from the rotation, and the functions are more um, complicated. Now, um, in the past, thermodynamics has often been uh, derived by just looking at consistency. Um, but you have to be very careful when you take a consistency argument because you have to make sure that you are varying absolutely everything. Because if you set one parameter to zero, um, you can, without realizing it, um, you might be uh, varying a constrained system and you, in that case, get, can get a one parameter family of first laws. So what we did first was we, derived a master formula. We, uh, I think initially we thought that the enthalpy would be M on K. Um, and so we saw that that was um, T naught uh, delta S and omega naught delta J, etc. So we managed this, this is, you know, a bit of an algebraic um, track, but it's not too bad. But here our T naught is what you would get um, by Euclidianization of the T that was in the previous metric. Um, the entropy is just the area over four. Here are the charges, um, phi and j. Uh, but now um, omega naught is the uh, angular velocity of the event horizon and v naught is the sort of standard um, geometric thermodynamic volume. So it almost looks like a first law, but 
you have this um, delta k on k squared, which you know must also be related to delta mu. So if we didn't have rotation, we could sort of get this to work. Well, no, we could get it to work. Um, but without rotation, there was a, a bit of a degeneracy. So um, we really, you know, what was going on? Um, and really what was going on was we'd had, A, we'd been not allowing, as considering something fully general, but B, we hadn't actually been um, looking at the right uh, way of writing the metric. So we decided to explore what was going on with the mass in three ways. So uh, more or less sort of representing the different uh, preferences, if you like, of the people in the collaboration. So we had a conformal computation, which we calculated the Ashtakar das mass. So that's David who liked that one. Um, we also had, uh, if we did slow acceleration, we could look at the boundary stress tensor and calculate the holographic mass. Um, and so that was Andres and myself. And then also David and myself computed the action of, you know, did the Euclidean action and computed the free energy in a sort of partition function approach. And is that consistent? So I think that actually that the last one was what we did first. And that was what revealed that there was something else going on. So if we go back to the metric, and I, I just forget about um, acceleration and cosmic strings for a moment, uh, in Gibbons, Perry and Pope actually noticed that if you take the uh, rotating black hole in anti de Sitter and look, go out to the boundary, then at the boundary, you don't have, <clears throat> you know, unlike asymptotically flat space, where as you go further and further from the black hole, your frame dragging drops off and falls away. In Kerr ADS, this doesn't happen. And in your natural Boyle-Inquist style coordinates, the boundary is actually rotating. And so what that means is that really uh, you need to consider the difference in angular momentum of the boundary and the horizon. Um, they also uh, felt that the time was not properly normalized and so introduced this alpha parameter. And as a result, they um, got different thermodynamic uh, parameters, but ones that gave you a consistent first law. So we took the lesson from them and we added in this alpha. We rescaled our time uh, by a potential uh, factor which, um, if you like, when I discussed the slowly wrote, uh, sorry, the slowly accelerating Rindler space, I also highlighted this factor of alpha, which was a discrepancy between the Rindler coordinate time and the boundary time. So if you rescale T, that's obviously going to change what you mean by temperature and mass, because T tells you essentially you know, it's, it's telling you how, um, what your energy is. So um, if we look at our temperature, we get a, a factor of one on alpha. The entropy is the same. Um, and uh, if we do our Ashtakar das method, we find that our mass parameter is now m on k scaled by alpha. So that's... Um, what you get. And if you also look at your conformal um, argument, so now we're going to sort of do a sort of ADS CFT type of argument. So one of the things you have to do to identify the boundary metric properly is you, you expand your metric near the boundary. And so what we do is we change from our uh, boyle inquist or black hole coordinates of R and theta, and we look at Z. So Z equals zero is the boundary. And psi is sort of essentially going to be like a cos theta. So it's going to be cos of a new theta. So we do this uh, coordinate uh, expansion near the boundary. And we kind of just go to as high order in N as we need to, to get the results that um, we need for computing uh, the holographic mass. So um, gamma mu nu here is the boundary metric. There should be no order z term. And then the z squared piece gives us a psi, the z cubed piece. Both of these terms 
contribute to the boundary stress tensor. So our F and G are determined by essentially requiring that there are no cross terms between the Z and the X mu's and that there's no order Z piece. Although actually, if we, if we do it order by order in Z, we find that no cross terms actually keeps no, the, um, you know, the right orders of Z in the square brackets. So it's, it's just a, a sort of chore that you do to uh, find this expansion. So for the boundary metric, we get this rather um, <laughs> sort of unhelpful looking thing, uh, at least at first sight, but it has an arbitrary function in it, this F1. So this is uh, not surprising because there's always a conformal class of metrics on the boundary, um, but we can extract from this a fluid stress tensor for the boundary and we see that it is not an isotropic it has a sort of isotropic piece which has to be trace free and then it has this anisotropic piece capital pi and the the format of those the functional form is is given here so that's sort of you know basically just a this is the sloggy calculational part of it so here's the plot this is what the boundary stress tensor looks like and actually, we did cross-check this against uh, work by Hubini and Rangamani, who had looked at uh, cases where you did have acceleration horizons. They've got the same stress tensor. So we compute our um, mass parameter by integrating up the boundary stress tensor, and we get the same result, I guess unsurprisingly, as the conformal method. So what is alpha? If we set the mass to zero, we get our, um, you know, we, we have our transformation for the slowly accelerating Rindler. Um, alternately, actually, if you demand the boundaries around two sphere, you get this alpha parameter. So inserting this alpha parameter into our definitions gives us a proper first law. So everything all just kind of completely unravels and cooperates. So um, here is the full whack where we have um, rotation, charge, acceleration, the works. Um, and you see, I guess if I can maybe go to the, if you go to the fourth line down, J is MA on K squared as before. Omega is still omega H minus omega infinity, a la Gibbons, Berry and Pope and our horizon um, angular momentum is now rescaled by this alpha parameter. You see alpha in the bottom right hand corner now has pieces coming from rotation and also charge. This capital Xi contains um, a charge piece. Now if you set capital A to zero you still have this Xi and this is again uh, from what Gibbons, Perry and Pope found. So uh, these are the, 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 I mean, you know, it is what it is. It's a bit of an algebraic mess, but it means that we can actually do the thermodynamics of the black hole. So to make it look a little tidier, what um, myself and a student of mine, Andy Scoynes, did was we um, tried to express things more in terms of just the charges. So again, this was, I think, motivated by uh, one of Brian's papers where he was talking about Penrose processes. Um, but we wanted to sort of take this, uh, this sort of starting point, this christodoulou ruffini mass formula. So it's, it's kind of taking the integral of the first law. So T is dm by ds, etc. So if you integrate up the first law um, properly, you get, you get this. So this is distinct from the SMAR formula. And so you get these, these characteristic patterns of 8ps on 3, 4 pi squared j squared on s squared, and pi q squared on s. So this is Kerr Newman ADS. <clears throat> so again, it was a case of algebra to try and figure out how to encode the deficits. Now, whereas we encoded it previously by looking at North Pole string, South Pole string, in many ways, it's more natural to think of an overall deficit, an average deficit, and a differential deficit. So we encoded the average deficit in delta, so that's like mu plus plus mu minus, and we just called this a C parameter, I guess, from C metric, which is the differential deficit. 
So C is non-zero if A is non-zero. And um, that's just a reminder of what the Xi parameter is at the bottom. So then if you do that, you find that although it's still quite long, um, things look a little less uh, all over the place. So here we have our Christodoulou Ruffini formula, which is modified with the overall average deficit delta and an extra piece C, for, which is the differential deficit. Now, what's interesting is that this C appears with a minus sign. So that means that somehow it's somehow exothermic. And this gives some interesting phenomena. So these are just the volume temperature, um, the rotation and potential, <laughs> and the lambdas. Okay. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that was uh, is sort of really fun when you do black holes in anti de Sitter space is you start getting interesting phase structures. So uh, the first time this was noticed, it was in the paper by Hawking and Page, where um, you see that uh, whereas a black hole in vacuum has a negative specific heat, uh, the temperature is proportional to 1 over m, so as it loses mass it gets hotter. In ADS, once you go beyond a certain size of black hole, uh, the temperature starts creeping up again. And so this is sort of related to the Hawking page transition. If you plot the free energy as a function of temperature, you see for small black holes, you get um, a sort of, you get very large temperatures and very low free energies, but you get this uh, sort of characteristic turnaround point, um, which is of course where the temperature is, is minimal, and then the free energy becomes negative. And so what this says is that once your free energy becomes negative, uh, this uh, configuration, the black hole, is preferred to a radiation bath. So you get this sort of phase transition between um, a radiation um, space-time and a large black hole. So if you now look at what happens if you have deficits, so first of all, uh, forget about acceleration, just look at an overall deficit and ask what happens to the free energy. So you look, you know, what you've got is this delta S. So even though you've got sort of, you're dividing by delta here, um, you're sort of essentially dropping the free energy. Interestingly, Hawking page transition, as well as your sort of minimal um, temperature doesn't change. So these are the sort of plots you get. The black line is the, the with no deficit, that's your sort of standard Hawking page curve. Uh, the blue line is sort of halfway there. <laughs> and the red line is where you practically cut out most of the space time. So you see the minimum T is the same for all of these situations. The crossover on the axis, the Hawking page transition is the same, but the, the sort of free energy, you know, here is damped down. So it kind of, it's, it's kind of an interesting, it, it's, it, it doesn't change the sort of key features but it does change the shape. So now what else happens? When you add charge or rotation, you get new critical phenomena. So typically, uh, as I just said before, for the uncharged black hole, the temperature is inversely proportional to mass. So as it gets smaller, it gets hotter, hence losing more mass, et cetera, et cetera. If you have charge or rotation, you can now have, uh, you have a sort of lower bound to the mass set by the charge. So you get what we call the extremal limit of a black hole, where um, it, the temperature actually drops to zero. So you now have, if you fix the charge of a black hole, you start off with it being extremal and zero temperature, you add a bit of mass, the temperature starts to go up. So now you've got positive specific heat. Now, if this was um, <clears throat> just in, in vacuum, you'd sort of eventually, uh, you know, hit, I guess this, <clears throat> sorry, what do you want to say there? Sorry. If you're in ADS, um, it, you can now, as, the, as you sort of add more mass to the black hole, it kind of depends on how big the charge is. If the charge is small, you end up turning, your, your temperature ends up dropping again. So you end up with a negative specific heat, which is what you would get in vacuum. 
Um, but then as you get big, your black hole gets bigger, you start going on that Hawking page curve again and your temperature starts going up. If the black hole or charge is big, then the temperature just increases. Sorry, I don't think I explained that well. So the black is an example of a large black hole, a large charge black hole, where the temperature goes up from extremality but keeps going up because the black hole is big. Uh, the red, on the other hand, is a small black hole. The temperature goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up. So how does that look if we plot the free energy? Um, so we see that um, our have I, have I gone and mixed those up? Hmm, I think I've gone and messed it up and done it the other way around. So here we have a nice smooth curve of free energy where we simply get the free energy dropping with temperature. But here we have this situation, and I'm really sorry, I think I've, I've messed up my Mathematica plots, where we, our temperature goes up, then it goes down, and then it goes up again. So we start moving from, uh, from the origin out to the right, then the temperature goes down. So we go, we, we sort of fo foliate up and then we come down again. So as we change our, the sort of charge parameter, we see the swallowtail develop. But now if we add in acceleration with something quite interesting happens. So let's just forget about J and look at these chemical expressions. So to make things a bit clearer, I'm going to write eight PS on three Delta as X because that, that combination comes up a lot. And then I'm going to express the charge as some, you know, in terms of some sort of parameter, little Q times C squared. So I can factorize my expression for M in terms of just this um, uh, sort of these roots, Q plus and minus, uh, which are, are sort of given in terms of this little Q here. So if Q is less than one, we have some real roots. This mass factorizes in terms of real roots and the enthalpy can actually vanish for suitable values of x, which is of course ps on delta. So if we fix the deficit and fix the differential deficit, fix the pressure, that means that for some size of black hole s, enthalpy can vanish. So what this actually means <clears throat> is that you get the swallowtail suddenly just stops, exists, snaps. So this was noticed by um, David and, and collaborators, David Kubisnik. Um, and but but they were they were um, doing this by plotting things parametrically from the um, the param you know the metric geometry parameters. If uh, from the the argument I've just given you is from the sort of chemical expressions, and then you can actually find the point at which it snaps. That's that little purple dot, um, and so you can sort of follow it through. Uh, you've got sort of nice algebraic expressions for what's going on. The other thing that Andy and I did with these chemical expressions was look at this reverse isoparametric inequality. So um, Svetogen and collaborators conjectured that black holes satisfy a reverse of what's known in mathematics as the isoparametric inequality, which is essentially saying that if you want to maximize your um, area inside a given uh, boundary length. So you have a piece of, a, a circuit, piece of rope of a certain length and you want to maximize your area, you make a circle. So that would be problematic for black holes if um, they, if a, a sort of circle, if, if for a given volume, you, your, um, your minimum area was spherical because uh, area of a black hole horizon is entropy. So that would be saying that for a given volume of black hole, uh, the least likely thing would be a round black hole. So it would be suggesting that round black holes are unstable. So you kind of expect the reverse of this isoparametric inequality for black holes. And, um, and so indeed, uh, they sort of showed that 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 was the case for from all the known, most known families of black hole. Now, what, how does the deficit change that? Well, we look, we can kind of play with the expression for M and V and combine them together to get uh, this, th this relation here. And so um, if we 
sort of manipulate we kind of just sort of go through various hoops and again i think this is in one of brian's papers but, um that we see that our um volume you know here we've got that our m squared we related is bigger than this this bracket which is then bigger than just pi m squared over delta s so now we see kind of we can cancel off our m squareds and we end up with a, a new inequality here for v squared um, and a sort of s cubed so um, our, our reverse isoparametric inequality now has a factor of one over delta in it. So just to recap, um, I've shown how we can allow for varying tension. We can now have thermodynamics of non-isolated black holes, black holes with strings through them, and it makes it's completely consistent. It's not a problem, um, but we can also allow the tensions to vary. If the tensions vary, the conjugate variable is thermodynamic length. Um, we can sort of completely nail the thermodynamics of accelerating black holes, but the key technical point was the normalization of the time-like killing vector. Um, and so I just wanted to finish by not saying very much, but just some um, work that I've been doing recently uh, with Andy and, and a master student is we've been looking at thermodynamics of many horizons we, there's also other solutions with not just one accelerating black hole, but many accelerating black holes, or indeed a whole array of black holes uh, aligned uh, along an axis and sort of held static by strings or struts. And so there is a generalized um, sort of first law where we take the total enthalpy by adding up the individual m on k's for each of these black holes, and it is simply equal to the sum of the T dSs and lambda d mu's. Um, so you can prove that for an arbitrary number of black holes. So it does seem, you know, tension, even though it doesn't appear in this SMAR formula, it does seem to have this thermodynamic role to play. So I think, um, you know, it'd be really kind of interesting to try and sort of dig a little deeper to sort of see what else it can do. So thanks uh, for listening and um, any questions? Well, thank you. Thanks Ruth uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Uh, thank you Ruth. <coughs> One question, when a string passes uh, through the black hole, uh, Sorry, but I know your microphone is, is, is started. Maybe it's too loud or something. It's too loud. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's then too sure. often for some reason. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, your passing of a string through a black hole seems to be a very quiet process. Uh, do you expect any gravitational radiation? Do I expect what, sorry? The uh, uh, gravitational radiation. Oh, right, sorry. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. It was a very cheeky process. It was far too calm. Um, I think it was to show that even in the minimal, the most non-disruptive case, you're still getting some change in the black hole. In reality, you would expect um, to, you know, the string to wrap around, you would expect some radiation, you'd expect a bit of probably ring down of the black hole, and I would expect that, in fact, the black hole would absorb more than that amount of energy. Even the cosmic string would, would have, um, you know, if, if you sort of think about how, how, what happens to the string as it goes through, it's going to uh, sort of be dragged back, the the uh, the string will wrap around, the, the, it will reconnect. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you can see me, but um, and then you know the you know that there will be a sort of snapback, if you like, and there'll be some also some waves. I would imagine going along the string. So you're absolutely right. It's going to be a far more energetic uh, process than that uh, particular cartoon indicated. I think that was as um, the sort of what's the least that could happen. Okay, thank you. Someone else, another question? Can I ask Ruth? Um, can, yep. can, Brian, go ahead. can you use the black holes like a pair of scissors to cut and join strings? Um, and I'm trying to envision a situation where you have two strings that are in loops 
and a black hole comes along and takes a segment of each string and something happens inside and then when the black hole lets the strings go, they're linked. Could you Sorry, that? Brian, could you just repeat? Because I think everyone's got their mics unmuted and something came in in there. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can use a black hole as a way of cutting and linking strings. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have two strings that are in loops. Right. Independent of each other. And right. a black hole comes along and uh, gets one Grabs segment one. of one loop and a segment of the other. Oh, I see what and you're saying. And then the black yeah. hole leaves them, then they, they might be linked together. Is that possible? They could, yeah, potentially, I guess, because it would, so it would probably also depend on the orientation, because if, if, the, um, if it grabbed one and then grabbed another, for the strings to reconnect, you'd have to have them kind of going in the opposite direction so they could annihilate near the horizon, uh, ping, you know, this, the, the new loop could then uh, sort of leave the uh, vicinity of the black hole. Um, so, so in, but in principle, yes, it could do that. Thanks. Uh, another question, anyone? Is there someone wanting to get in there? Um, if I might, Ruth, I'm curious to know is you described the ADS boundary, mm -hmm. and it's one might one would expect that there's probably some uh, field theory, some conf possibly conformal field theory that it's describing on the boundary in some three dimensional one. I'm not sure what would this tension correspond to in that so setting. So if you have the string going to the boundary, then the conformal boundary is highly non-trivial because it has a conical deficit in it, which is uh, something that people don't usually do in ADS CFT. Um, and so, in fact, when, when Veronica and Mukund were looking at the C metric, they deliberately put the horizon out to the boundary because they didn't want to have this sort of uh, structure. Um, so, yeah, so that's the first kind of uncomfortable corner, if you like, I think, for people who usually do uh, gauge gravity. Um, nonetheless, you know, having a, having a conical deficit, um, you know, you, people have looked at field, quantum field theory in the present, you know, on a cone. So, um, mm -hmm. so it's... I mean, it, it's sort of been something I've been, uh, you know, curious about, but haven't necessarily, but not yet, you know, <laughs> kind of geared myself up to to actually sort of go any further with. But um, but presumably the um, the anisotropy that you see in the stress tensor is kind of coming from uh, actually the conical um, structure on the boundary. Mm. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, other questions? Al, you are very quiet. No, I'm listening and learning. Mm. Um, if there are no other questions, I think we can thank Ruth again for a stimulating talk. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I will stop the recording and we can have a